Let's review the Unit 6 of AP Biology on gene expression in just about 15 minutes. Hey guys, this is Mikey with AVO Prep Academy, and today we're taking on the Herculean task of reviewing the Unit 6 of AP Biology in a relatively short period of time. We'll discuss all the major ideas and themes on Unit 6 that you need to know for the May exam. Now, if you happen to have a teacher who asks very specific questions on your school exam, then check out the links in the description below where I've posted videos that go into greater detail about each of the chapters that are part of Unit 6. But looking at the unit as a whole, it's pretty well divided into three major sections. One, DNA's discovery, structure, and its replication process, two, transcription and translation, and three, regulation of gene expression. The chapter listings will be provided in the description below so you can jump to any of these sections throughout. Unit 6 begins with chapter 15 of Campbell Biology that largely covers the history that led up to the discovery of DNA structure by Watson and Crick in 1953. We begin with three important figures. First is Friedrich Griffith. He experimented with two strains of bacterial species called Streptococcus pneumoniae, the R strain and the the S strain. The R strain was harmless while the S strain caused disease. In his experiment, as shown in this picture, the expected results came from the inoculation of the S strain and the R strain, and even the heat killed S strain. But when the solution from that heat killed S strain was mixed with living R strain, suddenly the bacteria became pathogenic, which was unexpected. Today, we know what actually happened was the leakage of pathogenic DNA from that S strain that was picked up by the R strain, thereby transforming it into a pathogenic state. By the way, this experiment was later repeated by Avery, McCarty, and McLeod to confirm that the transforming material was in fact DNA. Next, we have the Hershey Chase experiment, where the scientists created two different variants of a virus that attacks bacteria. In one variant, they radioactively labeled phosphorus to detect its presence, while in another, they labeled sulfur. This, of course, was to differentiate DNA from proteins, as DNA exclusively contains phosphorus, while protein exclusively contains sulfur. Infecting bacteria with these phage viruses showed that the transfer of genetic information let's say, was due to the presence of phosphorus in the bacterial cells, further confirming the role of DNA in carrying genetic data. The third and the last important experiment was conducted by Erwin Chargaff. Now, AP Bio doesn't go into the specifics of how he ran his experiments, but rather the results, which indicated that in DNA, adenine and thymine always occurred in equal amounts, while guanine and cytosine occurred in equal amounts. This, of course, is a reflection of DNA's complementary base pairing, which of course will be proposed by Watson and Crick in that paper. So once we get to 1953, Watson and Crick would publish that structure of DNA as we currently know it, inspired of course by Rosalind Franklin's X-ray crystallography photograph of that DNA molecule. But it's at this point that the textbook pivots from the history to science and assumes that you're familiar with that structure of DNA from its previous appearance in Unit 1, Biochemistry. So I also won't go into the structural detail of DNA, but you can find a link below in the description that can cover that specific material in much greater detail. What's more important to note from this chapter though is the replication of DNA. So let's put some facts on the table before we review that process. One, DNA replicates through a semi-conservative replication mechanism, meaning that each of the DNA strand in the double helix acts as a template to create its complementary strand. Two, DNA must be synthesized from a five to three prime direction. Three, the origin of replication serves as the start point for the DNA replication machinery to mobilize and execute the replication process. With these ideas in mind, let's take a look at the model of DNA replication. We always look at this DNA replication model focusing on just one side of that replication bubble. Here we see the enzyme helicase unwinding that double helix, exposing each of the two DNA strands to be used as templates. On the top strand, we have the DNA molecule that runs from 3' prime to 5' prime toward this replication fork. The first enzyme in the DNA synthesis process is primase, which actually puts down a relatively short sequence of RNA against the template strand of DNA. Because nucleic acid is elongated from a 5 to 3' prime direction, we see that the direction of primase's movement is toward that replication fork. Once a short primer is laid down, DNA polymerase 3 takes over and continues the elongation process, except this time putting down that proper DNA. This polymerase should follow pretty close to the movement of the helicase. Now we call this the leading strand, but on the opposite strand called the lagging strand, we have a DNA that runs from 5 to 3 prime towards that replication fork. Here we have to synthesize the new strand of DNA in an opposite direction to the movement of the fork. As such, 
everything we saw in the strand above just happens discontinuously. So for instance, we have the primase laying down an RNA primer followed by DNA polymerase three. Then the primase moves towards that replication fork and lays down another primer in that exposed DNA. The process repeats. In both strands, the RNA primer is replaced by DNA by DNA polymerase one. And the disconnected fragments on the bottom strand called the Okazaki fragments are connected together by ligase. This process would occur in exactly the same way on the other side of that replication bubble, except that the leading strand is now at the bottom and the lagging strand is at the top. Keep in mind that the terms bottom strand and top strand are only true in this picture, but if the primes were to be flipped, so would the names of the top and bottom for that different model. Now that we have the basic model of DNA replication model out of the way, let's take a quick peek at the difference between eukaryotic and prokaryotic replication. In prokaryotic cells, where there is one circular chromosome, there's only one single ORI from which the replication bubble moves in opposite directions. In eukaryotic cells with much larger chromosomes and many of them, there are several origins of replications that eventually all connect together to form that new copied chromosome. Okay, moving on to part two, we get to the next chapter, which is chapter 17, titled From Gene to Protein. Here we get to ask the question of why it is that cells are replicating this DNA and what it means for DNA to be called the blueprint of life. Just a moment ago, we discussed how DNA is found in large structures called chromosomes. In each chromosome, there are discrete segments of thousands of base pairs that we call genes. These genes are responsible for carrying genetic data that have the capacity to produce proteins. The reason that this is so important is that proteins, as you've seen in unit one, has a tremendous number of functions. So by producing these proteins at the right time in the right cells, an organism will be able to carry out all of the processes necessary in order for it to develop, grow, survive, and eventually reproduce to just pass on that very same information to its offspring to do the same. Let's see how this gene expression works. Firstly, we need to know that DNA isn't used directly to make proteins. Genes are copied onto a transcript or a copy that we call messenger RNA that carries that genetic data to the ribosomes. Now, of course, ribosomes are little protein factory machines that actually create the proteins through the polymerization of amino acids. So these proteins are made from a sequence of those 20 amino acids in some hundred or hundreds that all interact through their chemical characteristics to form that three-dimensional structure that confers their functions. The genetic code works by combining three nucleotides in a short sequence that we call the triplet codon. As this table shows, sequences like AUG encodes for methionine and it's the start codon. These triplet codes produce 64 possible codons of which three are used as stop codons and the remainder are used with some level of redundancies to encode for all the 20 amino acids. So as you can imagine, a long sequence of nucleotides with their nitrogenous bases could be used in linearly encoding information on the sequence of amino acids that would eventually form from that gene expression pathway. The first part of this pathway is called transcription, which deals with copying of that DNA data in a gene onto a messenger RNA molecule. Let's take a look at that transcription first. Now genes encode data from a five to three prime direction, typically called the coding strand. In transcription, however, this strand is typically left alone. Rather, its complement along its three to five prime direction is used as a template to form that RNA molecule. Let's see how this looks. Here we see the DNA strands as described before, and we see the important region called the promoter. It's slightly upstream of the transcribed region called the transcription unit. During the first phase of transcription called initiation, a bunch of regulatory proteins called transcription factors begin binding to that promoter by recognizing its sequences. This allows for the attachment of the RNA polymerase, the enzyme that strings together RNA by using the template strand of DNA. During elongation, the second phase of transcription, that template strand of DNA is read from a three to five prime direction as the new RNA nucleotides enter the RNA polymerase and temporarily form those base pairing bonds between A and U and G and C. As the RNA polymerase moves along, this newly synthesized RNA, which incidentally looks a lot like the coding strand of the DNA, snakes out of the polymerase. And finally, in termination, everything dissociates and the RNA has now been produced from the gene. In eukaryotic cells, however, there are a few extra steps before that RNA is fully ready to be exported from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. First, we have the five prime cap, which does three things. It helps to export that mRNA from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. It helps to protect that messenger RNA from degradation by digestive nuclease enzymes in the cytoplasm. And finally, it also helps to bind the small ribosomal subunit to that mRNA to initiate translation. Second, we have the poly A tail, which is just a ton of adenine nucleotides added to the three prime end of the mRNA molecule. This also protects mRNA from degradation. Lastly, we have the RNA splicing, where sections that we call the introns are cut out while regions called exons are stitched together. This process offers alternative 
ways of splicing the RNA together so that we can have many different varieties of protein products from a single gene as different exons are combined in various permutations during this process. And now we can move on to translation. Once the mRNA enters the cytoplasm, that 5' cap we discussed earlier helps to bind the small ribosomal subunit to the 5' end of the mRNA. It scans down the length of the RNA until it finds AUG, the start codon. It's probably important to note here that the AUG corresponds to methionine as mentioned before. So here we see an important molecule called the transfer RNA, which acts as a translator or an adapter that connects the nucleic acid data to its amino acid counterpart. For instance, a tRNA molecule with a UAC in its anticodon loop would chemically bind to AUG on the mRNA while itself carrying methionine to ensure that the codon and its correct amino acid are chemically connected together via that tRNA molecule. Once this methionine tRNA is bound to the start codon, the large subunit lands on top of the small subunit and the mRNA, placing this initiator tRNA into the P site of the large subunit. This allows for the A site ahead to allow for the next tRNA to be matched to the codon. Once the right tRNA match has been made, the two amino acids form a new bond called the peptide bond, while the whole machinery moves now three bases forward. This would naturally allow the tRNA no longer bound to methionine to be pushed out of the exit site, while allowing the A site to be open for the next tRNA. This process continues until the codons UGA, UAG, or UAA are found in the A site. Here, instead of a tRNA molecule, a release factor would come into that A site, breaking the whole machine apart, releasing the polypeptide, the two subunits of the ribosome, and the mRNA, which of course can be used again and again for translation until it's finally degraded. The last bit to note here is that certain proteins destined to be placed inside vesicles to either enter another membrane-bound organelle or be exported outside of the cells are produced on the endoplasmic reticulum to be placed inside of the ER lumen. Here we see that the recognition of this process occurs through a short amino acid sequence at the beginning of the translation process known as the signal peptide. This sequence of amino acids is recognized by the signal recognition particle, which in turn brings it to an SRP receptor on the rough ER membrane. The attachment of the SRP on its receptor opens the translocation channel, which then allows the remainder of the translation process to feed the polypeptide into the ER lumen. From there, it can now be packaged into vesicles. Okay, so that covers the basics of DNA replication and gene expression. So what about mutations? Here in this unit, we explore nucleotide mutations that are either considered to be point mutations or frame shift mutations. For both cases though, keep in mind that because nucleotide sequences program the amino acid sequences, a change in that sequence of DNA could potentially result in a change to the amino acid sequence. This can sometimes alter the structure of the polypeptide sufficiently to create a non-functional protein. So let's take a look at how we categorize different types of point mutations first. First, we have the silent mutation. In silent mutations, there is a change in a single nucleotide from one base to another, but because of the redundancies in our genetic code, the amino acid doesn't actually change. This is very common with point mutations that occur at the third position of the codon. Next, we have the missense mutation. In missense mutations, I like to think of the word mistake because here, due to the change in a nucleotide sequence, we get a different amino acid at a single position along the polypeptide. It might be worth noting here though that if the mutation results in the replacement of an amino acid by another of the same kind, say polar to polar or an acid to an acid, then we may not see as drastic of a change in the function of the protein. While a change across the aisle in chemical properties would most likely result in a non-functional protein. Lastly, we have the nonsense mutations. Here, the word to focus on is non, because in a nonsense mutation, as the codon changes, it becomes a stop codon, stopping the translational process and adding none of the remaining amino acids along the chain from the point of that mutation. But here too, you can imagine how important the placement of this mutation could be along a gene. Early in the gene, the gene would be cut extremely short, whereas later on in the gene, it might not create as many problems. Now, frame shift mutations are pretty crazy. As the name suggests, the mutation shifts the reading frame of the triplet codons, potentially creating a huge problem for the polypeptide. They occur due to either an insertion or a deletion of a nucleotide somewhere along the gene. As the picture suggests, the addition of that one nucleotide shifts the entirety of the reading frame that follows, potentially leading to what we call an extensive missense or even an early termination due to a nonsense mutation. Finally, let's move on to regulation of gene expression. This is potentially the hardest part of the unit because here we're looking at how the expression of certain genes can be regulated by external factors such as the presence or the absence of sugars. In AP Biology, we look at two major examples of gene regulation by prokaryotes by learning about the lac operon and the trip operon. Let's begin with the lac operon. The lac operon is a system that 
regulates the expression of the lactase gene, which is responsible for producing the enzyme lactase. Now, why do we want to produce lactase? Well, this is because lactase is an enzyme that breaks down a disaccharide called lactose so that they can derive glucose and galactose for energy processing. But the catch is that they shouldn't express the lactase gene when there's no lactose in the cell, because what would be the point of that? So here we see what we call an inducible operon, which means that we can turn it on when we need it, but it will be off by default. And when we need it, it would of course be when lactose is present. So here is how this is going to work. The lac operon has a promoter and the structural genes, including that lactase gene. But in between though, it has something called an operator. But just wait on that for a moment, because somewhere else along the chromosome, there is yet another gene called the lac I gene, and it produces a protein called the lac repressor, which when it's transcribed and translated forms a protein that sits on that operator by default, blocking the RNA polymerase from transcribing those genes. But when did we want these genes to be expressed? Well, when there's lactose. So it turns out that lactose, when found in the cell, can bind to that repressor, which then changes the shape of that repressor and removes it from the operator. This now clears the way for that RNA polymerase to produce lactase, well, because lactase is present. The second example is the trip operon, which sort of works in the opposite direction. Here we see that the genes trip E to A are all responsible for the synthesis of tryptophan. We see the operator again, but in this case, the operator is normally not occupied by anything. But during the synthesis of tryptophan, we may come across a situation when we have too much tryptophan, and it is then that the tryptophan will bind to the trip repressor protein, again produced by another gene, that can now bind and block further synthesis of genes involved in the tryptophan production pathway. These are simply feedback mechanisms which evolve to either conserve resources or curb overproduction. For eukaryotes, the situation is a bit more complicated, but here just keep three things in mind. One, chromatin can be tightly packed or loosely packed by histone proteins to either allow genes to hide away or expose them for transcription. To loosen the chromosomes, histones are said to be acetylated. Two, mRNAs can be bound by proteins or other small RNA molecules like siRNA or microRNA to reduce the degree of translation. And lastly, gene-to-gene -gene regulation by products such as transcription factors can create a hierarchy of gene regulation pathways that can become pretty complicated, which is why you just need to know about it but not know the details of it for the purpose of this course. All right, except for that last bit on biotechnology, we've covered all of the conceptual content for Unit 6. For this unit, there are several videos I've previously released that go into the details of Chapter 16, 17, and 18, which you can check out in the description below. But as as always, if you found this video helpful, consider liking this video to boost that engagement metric and consider subscribing to the channel for more content just like this coming up very soon. This has been Mikey with Able Prep Academy. Now go cook this exam and post your grades in the comments below. We'll see you very soon.